Hello, I'm Professor John Kelly and this is the Weber Auto YouTube channel. Today we are going to look at the front drive unit and electric motor from a Tesla Model S. Now all of the all-wheel drive Tesla Model S versions up through 2018-2019, somewhere in that range, uh, use this same front electric motor that we're going to look at today. Uh, for 2019, at some point, I don't know exactly when that changed, maybe some of you do and can put that in the comments, but Tesla announced that they would be putting a permanent magnet rotor based electric motor in the front of the Model S. And from what I can tell from reading and looking at used parts on eBay, the front motor that they put in the Model S is really the rear motor from the Tesla Model 3 just put in a different housing to fit in the Model S in the front. Now I could be wrong on that, but it sure looks suspiciously the same. Before we dive into the front drive unit and electric motor for the Model S, uh, I want to show you all four rotors from the electric motors of the Model S and X and then the Model 3 as well. If you purchased a rear-wheel drive Model S, you receive the large rear electric motor. If you purchased an all-wheel drive Model S, then you got two of basically the same motor, one in the rear and one in the front. They're in different housings, but it's, it's the same motor. It has the same uh, internal parts, the same power ratings. If you got the performance version of the Model S in the all-wheel drive. Then you had the large rear induction motor in the rear and the small front induction motor in the front. And then for 2019 uh, Model S, you got the rear large electric induction motor and a front permanent magnet motor. So those are the different combinations. These three rotors right here for the Model S and X. Now, if you get a Model 3, then you have the rear motor is this, has this rotor right here, which is a permanent magnet uh, rotor. And I'll have a different video on that coming up. And then in the front, you have this smaller, much smaller than the Model S, induction motor uh, in the Model 3. And I don't know what they did in the Model Y yet. Uh, from what I've read and seen, it's the same in the rear and it, in the front, it just has a different rotor design that doesn't have a copper core. It uses an aluminum core. But I, I need to get more information on that. That's just what I've seen and, and uh, read. So here's some additional photos showing you a comparison of the Tesla Model S large electric motor rotor and the rear electric motor rotor. And then here's some comparison photos showing the Model 3 rear electric motor rotor to the Model S per performance electric motor rotor and the front induction motors um, for the Model S and the Model 3. Okay, I have completely disassembled and cleaned all of the parts for the Tesla Model S front drive unit with the small electric motor. Um, the Empty housing here has a few things to look at. We've got places for three bearings, just like on the rear drive unit that we looked at a, a few months ago. Uh, we have some holes right here for the three phase cables to co go through from our stator to the inverter on this side. And then on the other side, this is where the inverter itself connects. There's a removable plug in the bottom of the case that lets you go in and disconnect the cables from the inverter to the stator assembly. This plug is normally bolted down and it has this tamper-proof tape on the outside of it that if you try to peel that off, it'll, it'll show that it has been removed and that may or may not affect your warranty status depending on who's doing the work. 
Okay, so the front drive unit needs a differential to allow the front wheels to turn at different speeds when you turn corners. This uses just an open style differential, which means that there's nothing to try to force the wheels to turn the same speed. There's no pause attraction or limited slip or anything like that. Uh, the vehicle does have traction control where it uses the brakes uh, to act like a limited slip differential, but there's nothing in the differential itself uh, to act like that. Now, I wanted to compare the front drive unit differential to the rear drive unit. So let's bring in the one that we had in the previous video and we'll do a comparison here. So the rear drive unit has a 213 millimeter diameter ring gear that's 50 millimeters thick. The front drive unit has the same 213 millimeter diameter ring gear, but this one is only 40 millimeters thick. So it's 10 millimeters less. Um, I had several people ask why is the ring gear so big? and Why are these bearings from SKF so big on these uh, differentials? And it's because of the torque multiplication if that takes place with gear reduction. If we have an electric motor that produces all of that torque and then you run it through gear reduction, the, the torque delivered to the axle shafts, the CV shafts and the tires is basically your motor torque multiplied by the gear reduction gear ratio. Okay, so the bearings must be large to be able to handle that amount of torque. The gears must be large because all of that torque is transferred one tooth at a time. So if you're transferring all of that torque, you need a big tooth, gear tooth, to be able to transfer that. The front electric motor on the Tesla Model S isn't as powerful as the rear motor, so it can get away with a little bit thinner of a ring gear. They both are bolted down with 16 bolts. And yes, I made a mistake in my previous video, and I apologize to Nissan Leaf uh, people and those that caught my mistake. I said that the, the, the ring gear on the Nissan Leaf was only bolted down with six bolts. I was wrong. It's eight bolts. I knew it was eight. I don't know why I said six, but anyway, I apologize. Uh, so we've got 16 on the front of the Tesla Model S, 16 on the rear. It's pretty much the same bearings. Uh, this bearing here is 100 millimeters by 25 by 45. This is the exact same bearing. These are the SKF Explorer Series precision bearings made for high-speed operation. The front will be only rotating at 1,877 RPM at the top vehicle speed of 155 miles an hour. And that is very close. It's actually, it's a little faster than the 1,841 RPM that the rear motor would spin at. Okay, you might be wondering how, how does the front drive unit end up spinning faster than the rear drive unit? If you look at these photographs here of the tires and tire sizes from our performance uh, Model S, you can see that the rear tires have a tire size of a 265 35ZR21. And that gives them a diameter of 28.3 inches or 718.8 millimeters. If you look at the photograph of the front tire and tire size here, you can see that it has a tire size of a 245 35ZR21. So these both tires use 21 inch wheels, but the shorter tire in the front with the 245 size is only 27.75 inches tall or 704.8 millimeters tall. That means the front tires are 14 millimeters shorter than the rear tires, which means that they will spin faster. Okay, so let's get this rear drive unit differential out of the way and we'll take our front drive unit differential and set it down in the case. There we go. The ring gear here has 79 teeth on it compared to the 78 teeth of the rear drive unit that we looked at in the previous video. Okay, here's the counter shaft for this front drive unit. It has a counter driven gear with 77 teeth on it and it has the pinion drive gear for our ring gear over here with 21 teeth. And the 21 teeth driving the 79 teeth of the ring gear 
gives us a gear reduction between the counter drive gear and the ring gear of 3.7619 to 1. Now, just a quick comparison of the rear drive unit uh, performance motor counter shaft to the smaller front drive unit. You can see they're, they're very similar. Um, the bearing on the front unit, uh, the SKF bearing on the front unit is a smaller bearing, um, but it has the same rating as the other one over there. This side of the bearing is the locating bearing. It has this plate that bolts it into the case and holds it in place. So as the gear expands and, and contracts and any force from the beveled teeth that we have here on the gear, pushing it one way or the other um, is held in place. The shaft is held in place with this with the bracket here. So this counter shaft at the top speed of the vehicle is only spinning at 7,063 RPM, which is well within the limitations of the bearings on this uh, shaft here. There's another bearing down in the, the housing here that this is going to sit down into and drive our final drive here. So that's two of the three <laughs> main moving parts inside of this drive unit. Uh, the next one that we need to look at is the shaft, the counter drive gear that drives the counter driven gear here. And that's the one that connects to the electric motor rotor. So let's bring that in here next. Okay, so this gear right here on the end of the electric motor rotor is what drives our counter driven gear. But before we get into that, let's just do a comparison of the front electric motor rotor to the rear electric motor rotor. These are both induction motor or induction machines, and these are both copper core. They're very heavy. Uh, this front one weighs 19.3 kilograms or 42.6 pounds. The rear one weighs 27.58 kilograms or 60.8 pounds. This rear induction rotor has 74 bars going between the shorting bars at the end here. This one has 70 instead of the 74. So it's a little bit smaller diameter. The front motor is 164 millimeters in diameter or 6.46 inches. The rear motor is 194 millimeters in diameter or 7.64 inches. Let's see, what is that? Uh, 30 millimeters larger diameter on the rear motor. And then for length, we have 131.6 millimeters or 5.18 inches compared to 154.8 millimeters, so about a 23 millimeter length difference, uh, or 6.9 inches on the rear uh, rotor here. They both have maximum torque pretty close to the same RPM. The rear motor has its maximum torque at 5,630 RPM, and the front motor has it at 5,573. But keep in mind, these have different size tires on them. So at what vehicle speed are those peak torque RPMs actually met? Okay, uh, let's take a look at the power ratings and some other things for these, these rotors here. Uh, for the front induction motor, it's rated at 190 kilowatts or 259 horsepower. And the same motor that's in the rear of the all-wheel drive Model S non-performance versions has the, the exact same specifications. Uh, it will put out uh, 331 newton meters of torque or 244 foot-pound force of torque. By comparison, uh, we have 370 kilowatts on the rear motor, 190 kilowatts here. So a little less than double the power on the rear motor versus the front. Uh, for the torque, we have 636 newton meters on the rear versus 331 on the front. So a little less than double <laughs> the, the torque. So a very high performance induction motor on the rear. You, you might call it a low performance induction motor on the front, but it's not low performance at all. It, it still has 190 kilowatts, 259 horsepower, and there's two of these. You got one in the rear also. So you still have 518 horsepower on an all-wheel drive Model S 
that's not even the performance version. And that's more horsepower and more combined torque, 662 newton meters of torque, than most performance cars have. Uh, that's, it's just incredible. All right, um, we talked about uh, the, the, gear, or the gear ratios. So uh, this rotor here will have to spin 9.3441 times for every rotation of the tire on the vehicle. The rear motor has to spin faster at 9.7344 rotations of the rotor to one revolution of the tire. And then the, at the top speed, 250 kilometers per hour, 17,542 RPM on the front with the shorter tires, 17,919 on the rear with the taller tires. All right, this rotor has a reluctor wheel here on the end for the speed sensor that sits in the case right next to the inverter. It's right under the inverter cover. And so we've got a speed sensor right here that's gonna fit right over this. And it's going to measure not only the rotational speed, but the direction. Is it spinning forward or is it spinning backward here on the, the rotor itself? Um, this is a press on reluctor wheel. And so I've, I've pulled it off of there. So before I set this rotor and, and shaft back into the case over here, let's talk about the specialized bearings that are in this transmission. Uh, as with the rear drive unit with the uh, special SKF bearings, uh, this rotor also has some specialized bearings. And so does the counter shaft and the, the final drive um, differential unit, differential case there. Uh, this bearing here on this end is a conductive deep groove ball bearing, the Explorer series SKF bearing. But on the other side of the shaft, we have an electrically insulated ceramic bearing. And yes, in my previous video, I said that silicon nitride bearings uh, weren't ceramic. I was wrong. I, I admit it. I was wrong. <laughs> and thanks for the feedback. And, and anytime I'm wrong, I, I, I'm not afraid to admit when I'm wrong. Um, I do my best to try to make sure that I'm not wrong, but I, I'm only human. I mess things up too. So anyway, this is from what I can tell, the exact same bearing that's on the rotor for the rear drive unit, except it's not sealed. It doesn't have uh, its own lubrication put into it. This actually has the lubrication from this drive unit sprayed on it constantly while the vehicle is moving. And so this rotor, unlike the front rotor, this rotor spins in a wet environment. It's not totally submerged, but it is in a wet environment, unlike the rear one that was in a totally dry environment. This rotor is cooled by lubricant being sprayed on it. The stator is cooled by the lubricant being sprayed on it and through it. Uh, and so it, it's just a different design. Um, I don't think this one gets as hot as the rear one did because it doesn't have as much power. We're not inducing as much current into this induction rotor as, as we can in the performance versions of that rear uh, large motor. So we have an insulating bearing on one side, a conducting bearing on the other side. And then we also have here on the end of the housing that the rotor fits in, we have these little brushes right there. Do you see those brushes? Yeah, right there. Those are conductive little strands. And it's actually called a shaft grounding ring with conductive filaments. Now I cannot see a brand name on this and I apologize to the manufacturer uh, of this part if I say that somebody else did it and, and in fact it was you. But I searched the internet and the only one I could find that looked anything like this is made by a company uh, called Aegis, A-E-G-I-S. And they make a whole bunch of different grounding rings. And this particular one right here that I've highlighted in yellow looks just like this one here, but it doesn't have a brand name on it. And a shaft grounding ring 
is there to do exactly what it, what it sounds like. It's going to ground that shaft, electrically ground it. So these all these little brushes here are in constant contact with this rotor here, so that saves the bearings. If we had two conductive bearings, then that would give us a complete path through the shaft, through the housing, back through the shaft, and we would get arcing and pitting of the bearings, and they would destroy themselves uh, over time. And so these shaft grounding rings are there to make sure that it does not do that. So let's take this rotor now and put it in the drive unit housing over here. We've got our rotor, our induction rotor here, that is going to spin with its 31 teeth and drive the 77 teeth of the counter driven gear. That will give us a gear ratio between the electric motor and the counter driven gear of 2.4838 to 1. And then its 21 teeth will drive the 79 teeth of the ring gear and give us a gear reduction of 3.7619 to 1. So if we take both of those gear ratios and multiply them together, the 2.4838 to 1 from the rotor to the counter driven gear from the counter driven gear to the ring gear of 3.7619, we end up with an overall gear ratio of 9.3441 to 1. So we have to rotate this rotor 9.3441 rotations before we get one rotation of your tire here. And so here on our differential case, we have our side gears and our differential pinions. On one side of the front drive unit from the, the bottom side, we have a, a CV half shaft that goes out to, let's see, that would be the driver's side. So that would be, that would be the left front tire. The right front tire on this model has an additional shaft here called the jack shaft that slides into the, that slides into the side gear and extends out as a certain dimension. I, I haven't measured it, but what that allows us to have is equal length CV half shafts uh, on the front of this car. And that will help reduce torque steer under heavy acceleration. So that's the purpose of this uh, jack shaft right here. Okay, so in the first part of the video, we've just talked about the gears. But then we've also talked about how fast this rotor and the, these bearings have to rotate. And so we've talked about the special SKF bearings, uh, special design for these Tesla motors. And if you go to the SKF website, you can download a catalog. They also have an app for their bearings where you can look up the specs on them. And you can see some data in these screenshots here showing the maximum RPM uh, recommended for these bearings without doing something special. Well, Tesla does something special with these bearings to make sure that they can withstand higher uh, RPMs than their mechanical uh, speed limit. Okay, let's talk about the lubrication system on this front drive unit. This unit sits in the front of the vehicle kind of on a tilt, very much like this, to where this flat spot right up here, where there's a heat exchanger to cool the transmission fluid, would sit pretty much level, uh, maybe just slightly tilted. We have a gear-driven oil pump right here, some sort of a nylon plastic uh, type gear that is going to be driven right off the teeth of that 213 millimeter ring gear that your axle CV half shafts connect to and uh, move the vehicle down the road. The pump has an inlet arrow right here and it comes over to a fluid screen. Uh, I took this out and took it apart. It just has a little metal screen inside of it. And so think of this as the bottom area of the transmission where the fluid is going to be accumulating. And on the other side here, there is a fluid drain plug that would be down towards the bottom of the, of the housing with it installed in the vehicle. And then there's a fluid fill plug right up here. 
Now, um, one thing I read in the uh, instructions on changing this fluid is that unlike differentials and some other transmissions and drive units and so on, you don't keep adding fluid <laughs> through the uh, fill plug until it starts coming out because that will overfill this unit. So here, here's the fill plug right here. And this is approximately the angle it's sitting in the vehicle. If we filled it up <laughs> with fluid right there, the everything would be submersed in oil, which we don't want. Um, and so it gives us an exact specification for the amount of fluid going in uh, to the front drive unit. And it has a warning here. It says use exact, use exactly the specified amount of fluid do not fill to the top of the fill plug. And so the fluid that goes in here, and yes, in my previous video, I um, embarrassed myself by saying it was not Dexron 6 transmission fluid. Um, in this drive unit, prior to a certain drive unit part number, uh, it is not Dexron 6. It's a mobile SHC 629, which I've looked up if you look at that up on the internet, it's a special um, high quality PAO based um, synthetic gear lube. And it's intended for uh, applications where the fluid wouldn't be changed very often uh, and could last a very long time. Well, that was for drive units with the part number of 103500-00-F and earlier and so if we look at this drive unit part number right here on this 2016 it is the f unit and so that's one of the reasons i initially said these didn't have dexron in them because the fluid that came out of this was orange and dexron is red and it was a strange kind of an orange color and i, I wasn't sure exactly what it was but uh, if you have a model j or higher then it says to use dexron 6 uh, automatic transmission fluid and since the fluid that it's replacing is a high quality pao uh, based synthetic fluid you don't want to go buy the cheapest universal Dexron fluid you can find. This has to be licensed Dexron 6 automatic transmission fluid. And if you don't think it makes a difference, uh, I've got some videos on transmission fluid differences and specifications uh, that, that you really need to look at uh, and then see what you think. So yeah, it, it uses Dexron 6 on probably I would say the, let's see, this is 2016. It's got to be somewhere in the 2017, maybe, and above range that they went to Dexron 6. But anyway, it can be the previous, previous fluid. So if we follow the output of this pump here, it pumps fluid up, and it's going to go to five different things. And so the first place that it goes is through this little tube right here, as you can see in the photo, and that's going to spray lubricant over here on this rotor's bearing and gear. So the drive gear with the 31 teeth and that bearing down there that has to support this rotor spinning at 17,542 RPM at the maximum vehicle speed. That bearing needs constant lubrication uh, to be able to withstand the higher speeds that it might rotate at. Because at the higher speeds, the bearing gets hot, the ball bearings themselves expand, and these are special... Uh, expanded clearance or in larger clearance bearings uh, made to expand just a little bit. It's in, it's in micrometers that it expands, but it does expand. Um, and so it, it allows for um, that expansion to take place. So that's one of the five places it goes. The second place is it comes up through this hole right here and goes into a transmission oil cooler. A heat exchanger and so we have coolant coming in one of these ports here I don't know which one it is I couldn't figure it out so it's in one and out the other but there's coolant on these two holes and transmission fluid that comes in on this one and out on this one 
and there's four holes in the bottom of this transmission heat exchanger that looks very much like the heat exchanger portion of a chiller that is used to cool the coolant that is running through this. So on the front of the Model S, there's a, a chiller that looks just like this hanging down in the front. It's probably 20 millimeters taller and has air conditioning refrigerant running through it to remove the heat from the coolant that goes through it. And so this is a, a heat exchanger to get the heat from the transmission fluid into the uh, coolant. And then there's another heat exchanger to transfer the heat from the coolant into the refrigerant. And then that goes up to the two condensers in the front of the car and is radiated out uh, and blown out uh, with convection uh, heat transfer uh, into the air. Uh, and some might argue on cold days, if, if we're heating uh, the battery, that we could also run heat through the heat exchanger here to help warm up these gearboxes. I don't know if that actually happens. I still need to investigate that uh, further. All right, so there's two places. We, we feed lubricant to this bearing and gear on the rotor bearing that, that needs lots of lubrication. But the other one needs lubrication too. So the fluid comes through the heat exchanger and goes down and out this hole right here. There's a hole right here where this housing that has the conductive filaments in it to ground the rotor has this long tube right here that's going to fit in to that hole. So it's going to be like this. And if you look at this tube here, it has a whole bunch of little holes in it. Can you see those holes? Uh, let's see, that is called a sparge pipe, according to some feedback I received from users in my, or viewers in my previous uh, video. Um, a sparge pipe, where it's gonna, going to spray trans cooled transmission fluid down on top of the stator assembly, and then it has its own drip channels right here to run down onto the windings on the end of the stator assembly. So this is the second place, or the third place that that uh, transmission fluid goes. And this is after it's been cooled, it's cooled down. So we're using the cooler transmission fluid to try to cool the stator that gets really hot. And then inside of this housing, this pipe makes kind of a U-turn and comes back right here and sprays, as you can see in this photo, uh, on this rear bearing over here on the, the stator. The silicon nitride non-conductive bearing is what it's spraying its oil on. Okay, and then the last thing that that fluid feeds, I take that back, there's two more things that the fluid feeds. So there's six places that that fluid goes. We have a drip channel right here. As you can see in this photograph, there's little holes in the bottom of this where it drips transmission fluid down onto the front windings of our stator assembly. And then we have a inner spray nozzle right here that sprays on the rotor itself. So a complex, uh, lubrication system. It's especially important for these two bearings on this rotor that has to spin uh, clear up to the 17,542 RPM. Those bearings have got to be kept cool and well lubricated. So make sure you've got the right good quality um, transmission fluid and then make sure that you fill it only with the prescribed amount of uh, fluid, which I never gave you. Uh, for the transmission front small drive unit, it takes 1,750 milliliters or 1.8 quarts. For the small unit in the rear, it takes 2,250 milliliters or 2.4 quarts. Now you might be thinking, why does the rear small unit take more than the front small unit? Uh, the rear small unit has a remote mounted um, heat exchanger. It's not bolted right to the, the drive unit itself. I don't think there's room. So they put it off to the side there. And then for the rear drive unit, the, the great big performance one, it's 1,400 milliliters or 1 1.5 quarts. 
of fluid. So we've talked about the gears, we've talked about the rotor, we've talked about the lubrication, we've talked about the bearings. The last things we need to look at uh, are the electronics uh, involved here, the electrical components. Okay, this is the stator assembly for this front motor and I assume for the rear uh, small motor as well. Uh, this is a three-phase, four-pole stator. It has 48 slots uh, inside of it. And if you remember, the rotor itself has 70 bars. And so this is an induction motor. Uh, we're going to run three-phase current through these three windings here, three sets of windings here, and induce current into the rotor, which produces its own electromagnetic field that is attracted to and repelled by the magnetic field in the, the stator here, which makes it rotate. And they can change the, the speed of the motor by changing the frequency of the signal applied to it. They can change the torque that the motor produces by changing the amount of current going through it in relationship to the timing of where the rotor is within the stator itself. Uh, this stator assembly weighs 23.7 kilograms or 52.25 pounds. It's very heavy. Um, the windings themselves, the three-phase windings, I took my Hioki milli-ohm meter uh, and measured the resistance of these three windings, and I uh, measured 13.7 approximately milli-ohms of resistance. So that's 13.7 thousandths of one ohm per winding. I had 13.7 on one, 13.68, 13.52, uh, all in this 13.5 to 13.7 milli-ohm range. Now by comparison, the milli-ohm resistance of the rear drive unit, the performance rear drive unit, uh, they're only 5.3 milli-ohms, so almost three times less. So very low resistance, very high currents to induce high amounts of current into the induction rotor to give us a lot of torque, a lot of power. One thing that I'm picking up about induction motors, because I am certainly no expert on them, is that you can make these motors be very high performance by just running more current through the stator, uh, increasing the voltage, running more current through it, and inducing more current into the uh, rotor assembly. But then you've got a problem of everything gets hot. You gotta keep it cool and so on. So uh, the induction motors seem to be the performance type motors that are out there. Uh, but as you've probably seen in other videos and read, they're not quite as efficient as the permanent magnet synchronous reluctance motors or just plain permanent magnet motors uh, that have been out there uh, for uh, quite a long time. I think the reason that we still have an induction motor either in the rear or the front of these Teslas is there because it is a performance motor. And the internal permanent magnet synchronous reluctance motors that are either in the front on the Tesla Model S or the rear on the Tesla Model 3 and Y, those are the efficiency ones. And I'm curious, I don't know, I'm, I'm still trying to find out. Uh, as you drive down the road, does it use both front and rear motors equally or let's say if you are just cruising at a freeway speed and you have a permanent magnet style motor, um, does it run on that alone or mostly on that to increase the battery range that they're getting here? Uh, that's what I suspect. I, I haven't been able to prove it yet, but I'm working on that. Um, so I think they're giving us the best of both worlds. We have the induction motors for the super high performance combined with really good performance from the permanent magnet ones, but the permanent magnet ones give us a little better battery range because of their efficiency. And so, anyway, just some thoughts. I have no proof on it, but as soon as I uh, can, I'm going to try to get data from our, our Model S as we drive to see what is the split between the front and the rear. And if any of you know that information, if you've experimented on your own car, you've got uh, scan tool access or other means of grabbing those PIDs, those datas uh, off the uh, can line there, uh, let me know when you're cruising, is it mostly the permanent magnet motor that's propelling you or is it both? Uh, I'm very curious to find out. 
Okay, so this stator assembly, these three phase cables right here are powered by the inverter assembly right here. And some of you may recognize this from the video that I did on all the high power, uh, high voltage electronics uh, on the vehicle. And what I should have said is the, the high power connections uh, between all the high, high voltage uh, components. But this is the inverter. And the inverter has our DC power coming in from the battery right here. Uh, we have a negative and positive terminal connection right there. And then we have our three phase AC current going out right there. Power applied to these three phases, three phase cables right here on the stator assembly. And so that's the connection between the inverter assembly and the stator. The inverter is in control of the current and the voltage and the frequency uh, at the stator itself. Now this inverter assembly is liquid cooled. As you can see here, we have a coolant fitting right there and another coolant fitting right there. One is the inlet, one is the outlet. There's a heat sink in here. There's a vent right there. We have our low voltage electrical connection right here, our data uh, connection, our logic connection right there that are inputs. We've got uh, serial data, uh, CAN data. Uh, there'll be other inputs such as uh, throttle position and, and rear motor speed and brake pedal position and other pieces of data that are needed to control the, the front motor. I'm curious if somebody put the same size tire all the way around on a vehicle that was intended for different size tires. Uh, I suspect it, it'll work just fine, but somehow it's got to uh, learn that, pick that up. Um, have any of you done that? Have you taken off the two different size tires and just put on the single size tires? Um, and what effect did it have, if any? Oh, one other thing. Uh, the stator has a temperature sensor. And as you can see from these two broken wires right here, as I was removing the stator from the housing that it bolts to right here, uh, I accidentally uh, yanked on these wires and broke them. So there's, you can see a little tiny piece of the wire sticking out right there. But there's a temperature sensor inside the stator. Looks like just a single one with the two wires here. Uh, monitoring the temperature of the stator windings themselves. All those drip channels that we looked at, the drip oil down onto the stator, that's onto these windings of copper uh, wire right here. And then the stator frame right here is where all the holes in this pipe right here would be dripping fluid down, down onto that and cooling it uh, also. One last thing, <laughs> the, uh, the stator, as you can see, is open and exposed. Unlike the stator on the uh, rear drive unit from the previous video. And that stator actually sits inside of a big housing. So this housing right here goes over the stator and it sits right here on the transmission case. And so if I lift that off, the first time I lifted this off, uh, I saw this stator right here. There's two locating pins or two alignment pins right there that line up with a hole right here and a hole on the other side. And so this stator fits right down in and lines up with those pins. And then this cap right here fits right here on top of the stator assembly. And then this housing fits over the top of that. And so this housing had oil in it and it's, it's a complete kind of oil bath. It's not submerged, but there's certainly a transmission fluid that's in there for cooling and lubrication here on this model. And as I said, I'm, I'm almost positive from what I've seen on pictures of used rear drive units uh, of the small motor design, that it's the same thing on the rear. I, I could be wrong. If any of you know exactly 
what the rear motor is internally. I mean, does it look just like this? Is it is it the same? It's just in a different housing. I'd be curious to know uh, if that's the case. Um, I'm still looking for a front electric motor for the 2019 and above uh, Tesla Model S to see if it really is the same as the rear motor on the Tesla Model 3. From what I can tell, uh, it is, but um, I guess I guess we'll see. Uh, obviously, if any of you know uh, if I'm wrong or not, uh, let me know in the comments uh, as well. Okay, well, we've looked at a, a lot of things here on this uh, Tesla Model S front motor. Uh, I know it's a long video, but uh, there's a lot, a lot to it. It's, it's very interesting to look at uh, and explore, and I really enjoy that. Um, if you feel that you've benefited from these videos that I produce, please consider a donation to the Weber State Automotive Technology Department. Uh, there is a donation link at the bottom of the video description. Uh, for those of you who have donated, uh, thank you very much for your donations. I greatly appreciate those, and we are going to put that money to great use. Here you'll be able to see additional videos and comp of components that we would not be able to afford uh, without that, and I greatly appreciate that. So once again, uh, from Weber State University, uh, thanks for watching. Have a good day.